Uh, we want to uh, welcome back those who are comfortable enough to be here in, in person in the church. And uh, uh, I want to remind everybody uh, that there's no pressure whatsoever in making the decision to be in person or to, be, to join us online. Uh, one, of the, uh, one of the things that we are pledging is, is that uh, we're going to extend unconditional love and grace uh, to every person as they make those very personal decisions about how and when and those kinds of things to, uh, to join back in. Uh, and uh, we're, we're trying to uh, kind of muddle through this very odd and uh, kind of a weird season that we're all in right now. And we're gonna, but we're gonna do it with love. We're gonna do it with grace, period. And, and uh, uh, for those who did come back to in-person worship last week, I, I do wanna say that I did notice that some of them were uncomfortable. Uh, as I sat and I looked at the people who were here, I can sense that they were uncomfortable. But I, I really don't think it was because they, uh, you know, that they were in person, you know, in proximity to other people. What, what caused them to be uncomfortable was the first times that they weren't wearing sweatpants and pajamas on a Sunday morning. And so it kind of, you know, this feels different and weird, you know, and so getting used to hard clothing again is a whole new experience that we all have to go through. Uh, but uh, so today we're going to be uh, taking a look at endurance and uh, I think it's one of those relevant topics that uh, we certainly need to uh, pay attention to. So uh, would you join me as, uh, be, as we jump into our message time today with a word of prayer. Father God, we just want to give you praise and honor and glory. Thank you so much for the time that we now have as we allow your word to search us. We didn't come here to, to search your word. We, allow, we come here seeking to have your word search our hearts. So uh, may it be a mirror. May it be truth to us, Lord God. May it be the agent that you bring into our lives to not only change us, but to equip us Father, to, uh, to deal with the, ti uh, the, the times that we're living in. Thank you so much for this time, and we give you praise for it. Bless my lips that I might speak the truth of your word and reveal your heart and your mind in the midst of it. What a privilege it is, Lord God, to be able to look into the word of the God of creation. And uh, Lord, we do it with glad hearts. In Jesus' name, everyone said, Amen. 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 So for the last uh, several weeks, since this whole scenario began with us, uh, uh, I've been trying to pick out topics that are relevant to the, you know, to, to COVID, and and uh, and and so we kind of been jumping from one to the next. Uh, you know, we talked about finding the missing piece that our heart longs for, living a life free of worry, free of anxiety. Uh, we, you know, addressing the issue of uh, the lack of contentment. Uh, we talked about not wasting your quarantine, you know, uh, uh, faith, hope, and love, making sure that we're growing in those areas, and, uh, uh, and, and you know, I'm kind of addressing all the stuff that's up in our grill right now, you know, it's like pressing, you know, stuff that everybody's struggling with, but, but that's not the only thing that we need to do as we're, as we're going through this. We, we, we you know, it, it, it's one thing to define some problems, it's something else to put a strategy together that's going to take us beyond our, proj our, our problems and the struggles that we're dealing with, you know. And, and so we all need to use this time to kind of, we need to leverage this time, if you will, so that we can kind of, maybe at one point in the future, we're going to be able to get to a point, we're going to be able to look back to the COVID season and we're going to see how much we grew during that time. Uh, in, in, in a very real sense, all of the Bible is, is, is uh, given to us to cause that, uh, to, to help us to accomplish just that. You know, every, the, all the Bible teaches us how to leverage the issues that we encounter in life, you know, so that when we get on the far side of it, we come out in a, at a far better position. And so that's really what, what I want to start doing today. I want to turn the corner, if you will. And, 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 and we need to start developing a strategy you know, that, that's going to not only take us through this thing, but get us on the other side of it, that we're better equipped in our life than we were than when we came into it. And uh, so uh, I wanted to start that by, by dealing with the topic of endurance. And, and, and uh, that's what we're going to be taking a look. If you have your Bibles with you, I'd like you to uh, turn to Hebrews chapter 12. 
Uh, we're only going to be looking, actually, I'm only going to, with all the talking that I'm going to do, I'm only going to cover two verses today. Uh, you know, and, and uh, that's how long-winded I am, maybe. But I think that these two verses are really very, very, very powerful. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. How do you respond to a problem you thought was going to be just a sprint, a short little issue, but then find out that it turns into a marathon? I mean, and, and I kind of was thinking about that as I was uh, dealing with the topic of endurance. Have you got to the place, I, I know that I have, but have you got to the place, you know, and this thing just keeps on dragging on, and I'm just tired of it all, you know? You know aren't you tired of COVID? I'm tired of hearing the word. I'm tired of listening to the newscast. I'm tired of all the restrictions. I'm tired of the social distance, the mask, you know, the whole deal. I'm just tired of it all, you know? And, and, and uh, you know, it started a lot, you know, when this virus, you know, we heard about this virus back in January. And, you know, and, and, and I kind of thought, you know, well, I right, no big deal. The flu comes and goes. You got a couple of months, you know, you, 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 know, you kind of get through the flu season. That's about what we're going to have to do. And then January stretched into February, and then it was March, and then, then I was kind of thinking, you know, well, once we get to Easter, once we get to Easter, we'll just kind of move on beyond it, and everything will be okay then. And then Easter came and went, and then they started talking, well, it looks like it might go into May, you know, and now here we are in May, and they're saying, no, no, it's summertime, all the way through, now, no, no, maybe the fall, maybe next year. You know, and it's just like, oh my goodness, you know, all of a sudden this thing is stretching onto this life-consuming issue that dominates every aspect of our life for who knows how long. And, uh, you know, how much longer we got to deal with it, the kind of a thing. Yeah, you know, and you know, this, the, all the newscasts and people are losing their businesses and family income and businesses are being propped up by the government, handing out money that they don't have. You know, the, the politicians have this idea that if they just print money, it's real, you know, and, and it, it, it's kind of crazy, you know. Might as well go start using monopoly money because that's what it's going to be worth pretty soon. You know, uh, uh, people have stopped paying their mortgages temporarily. It's been on furlough. What in the world is going to happen after the three-month furlough ends and everybody has to pay four months of mortgage? You know, and, and, and it's just like, you know, it, it, it's crazy. You know, when, 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 social isolation. You know, I, I mean, everybody was thinking, you know, a lot of folks, about social isolation, not a big deal. I don't have to go to work for a couple weeks, stay home, watch Netflix till my, you know, I watch every movie that's ever been made. I eat till I can't eat anymore. Not a bad deal, you know? But then isolation really isn't that great of a deal we're finding out. You know the worst punishment that they can give to a person in prison? Yeah, social isolation. <laughs> and everybody's waking up to that reality. You know, and sometimes it's not being distanced from people, it's being locked in the same place with some people. You know, you've been locked into the house now for three, four months with people, you're thinking, man, I can't stand to be around them any longer. You know, and so everybody's struggling with this one way or another. How do, how do you respond to a problem you thought was going to be a, just a, a sprint, but all of a sudden it turns into this long marathon? And you know, and realistically, it's not just COVID, of course. You know, there's lots of times the, the, the problems in life that fall into this kind of a category. You know, lots of times we get into some kind of a situation, we think, hey, you know, it's not going to be that big of a deal. I can handle that. Might be a job loss or a health issue or maybe a difficulty in a relationship, a problem with a child. Or maybe it's a problem with a parent, depending upon the perspective, right? You know, you know and you can kind of think, I can deal with this. But then all of a sudden, the problem just kind of goes on. What should be a short-term sprint turns into a long uh, marathon, and, and it just seems like it's never going to end. And so I want us to spend a couple weeks dealing with this topic of endurance, because I think it's just one of those relevant things that we need. Now, let me set the stage uh, for us as we move into chapter 12. Now, I'm gonna, I'll be honest with you. Uh, I'm, I've got a long, long runway before I get my plane up off the ground today, all right? And, and the reason for it is, is that I need to, be, to start talking about Hebrews 12. I really need to set the context by going back to Hebrews 10, because that's really when the problem comes up. 
in, in, in Hebrews 10, the, the author of Hebrews is praising his audience because the, the, he, 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 he's preparing them for a long marathon. But in chapter 10, he starts off by telling them that when you started running this race, this race you were doing a really, really good job. You know, you, you, you faced some tough times and, and you had exactly the mentality, the perspective that you needed when these tough times came your way. Look at what it says, uh, Hebrews uh, chapter 10, verse 32. He says, recall the former days when after you were enlightened, you endured a hard struggle with sufferings, sometimes being publicly exposed to reproach and affliction, and sometimes being partners with those so treated. For you had compassion on those in prison, and you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property, since you know that you yourselves had a better possession and an abiding one. And so what he does is he says to them, I want you to think back when you first came into the faith, you know how a lot of people get really excited about the faith when they kind of wake up from the dead and you know experience the resurrection of Christ in their soul and and they're on fire and you can't shut them up man there's nothing that's going to start to stop them they're not worried about the problems in the world all oh, they're they're just in love with Jesus you know and, and and so they started out this way and problems come their way and that's very often most times in fact when you fall in love with the Lord your problems don't decrease they increase because the world hated him they're gonna hate you and and so they experience the fiery trials that come their way and he says you know I but I want you to think back when you when those things came your way when you first came into the faith notice what he says after you were enlightened so he's talking about the beginning days and he says, you know what, when you first came to faith, you started off, and man, I mean, you responded so well when you suffered. And you know, and, and he mentioned several things that they had to endure. They were publicly exposed to affliction. They stood with others who went through persecution. Even if they didn't face it themselves, they had compassion for people who were in prison. They didn't even get upset when their earth stuff was stolen and taken away from them by the government. You know, the government was coming and taking their stuff because, you know, they were claiming the name of Jesus. And, and, and you know what, and, 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 and really what he's saying, I want you to remember how God carried you through those trials. How God was with you. And how your hearts were aflame. And you were not disappointed because of the, the, the crisis that came your way. God carried you through all those, uh, you know, through all of them. You know, and you, you, you went through them with a sense of confidence and, and you felt God's keeping power, you know, and, and you endured a lot of stuff. And so what he's doing is he's, he's commending him. But then in chapter 10, he goes on and he gives him a rather stern warning. And he says, therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward, for you have need of endurance. Now, when he says that, what he's saying is, is that, yeah, you went through some bad stuff, but you better hang on. If you think you need an endurance then, boy are you going to need it in the future. If you think you've had it bad before, you're, you're going to have to realize how much you're going to need endurance as things continue to go on. And, and really it's his way of saying, you ain't seen nothing yet. You know? You got a long race to run. It's not going to be a sprint. It's going to be a marathon. And, 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 and then what he does in chapter 7, he goes on. And then again, I'd like just to kind of unwrap this and unfold all of it. I'd like to go verse by verse through chapter 7. But for my purposes today, I'm not going to do that. This afternoon, I want to encourage you. When you get, you, know, you get a little bit of a long time with the Lord today, open up the Hebrews chapter 11 and read through it. And what you're going to find is, is you're going to have one person after another you know, and, and he really, what he does, by the way, in chapter 11, he goes all the way back to the beginning of history. And he begins to talk about all these ancient saints and all the problems and conflict and crisis that they encountered. And one by one, he goes through them and, he, and, he, and you know, he, 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 he outlines how their faith gave them the ability to endure the crisis that came their way. You read through this chapter, of it's really the heroes of faith, and it really begins to dawn on you, listen to me, that, that you are not the first generation to face a crisis. 
that's common experience to every person who lives on the face of the earth. There's not a single person listed in Hebrews 11, in fact, that didn't face a crisis. And we're not talking about the run-of-the-mill kind of problems that we commiserate about often in life. We're, you know, it'd be nice if, you know, if that's all we ever have to do with. These people built, dealt with, I mean, crisis of biblical proportion. That's why they're there, you know. Uh, and, and throughout all of history, as the writer of Hebrew goes through, he says, you know, people throughout all of history had need of endurance. So, so in other words, don't think that your situation is unique. That's the whole point of the chapter. Everyone had in their own time, in their own culture, in their own ways, in their own circumstances, they all had a marathon to run. And, 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 and so it's just this long list of one person going through one crisis after another. And, and, and they can't do it. Listen, they can't do it without endurance. Neither can you. You know? And, you, you know, he just names a bunch of them. Noah, you know, he lived, he lived during a time of unspeakable evil. The entire world was evil, you know, and, and, and how's he going to respond? He had to build a boat for 120 years. Abraham, you know, he's called to leave everything that he knew and go to a place where God's not going to tell him where he's going to end up, but just follow me. You know, Moses, Moses could have enjoyed the comforts of the palace of Pharaoh. But you know what? He, he, he had to take a stand against the evil of, of, that was being, per, uh, being perpetuated against his people. Uh, Rahab, you know what Rahab, Rahab, all she had to do was keep her door closed. She didn't have to open it up to the spies, you know, but in so doing, she puts her life in jeopardy, you know, and so they face these crises one after another. And then there's these nameless others. They were flogged and imprisoned and stoned and mistreated and afflicted. They wandered about in, in deserts and in mountains and had to live in dens and caves. And they're all people who, have, uh, who had great faith that was displayed by their ability to endure through the crisis that came their way. They ran with endurance. And, and, and the idea, by the way, of course, you know, as you're reading all these stories, is, is that if they can do it, I can do it. If God enabled them to endure, he can certainly enable me to endure. Uh, and, and by the way, they didn't, just, they didn't just endure their crisis, they overcame their crisis. Uh, that's what heroes do. So, so now, at the very end of chapter 11, there's one other thing. I told you, I got a long runway today, okay? Uh, and, and, but at the end of the very interesting uh, contrast that I want to point out to you, this is an important contrast in the book of Hebrews. Now notice, he, he, he talks about people. If these ones came out in a very positive way. For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises. I'll come back to that word in just a minute. Stopped the mouths of lion, quenched the power of the fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, and put far foreign armies to fight. And so this is the first group of people that he's talking to. And what I want you to see about them is, is that they had a promise, and the promise was a victory. That they would be overcomers. And, and, and it comes about miraculously, by the way. Stopping the mouths of lions and quenching the power of fire. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Escaping the edge of the sword. Strong out of weakness. Became mighty in war. Put foreign armies to flight. So these are people who really are victorious. They received the promise of victory. And, and God gave a lot of them. Promised a victory to Joshua, to Gideon, to David. And those promises were, were, were fulfilled. Now with David, it was fulfilled somewhat in his life, but really being fulfilled through the Messiah and his arrival. But they got promises and they lived victoriously. Then there's this contrast of another group. Notice what he says here. Others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned and they were sawn in two. They were killed with the sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute and afflicted, mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy. What a wonderful phrase. Wandering about in deserts and mountains and dens and caves of the earth. And all these, though commended through their, uh, through their faith, did not receive what was promised, for God had provided something better for us that apart from us they should not be made perfect. So now we got this other group of people and you talk about the difficulties. It really stands in contrast to the, the previous group. 
You know, the, the, the other group faced their crisis and, and they came out of it victorious from a human perspective. But this group, from a human perspective, I mean, you know, they didn't get delivered out of their persecutions. You know, they, they listen, you know what? They did not see the end of their crisis during their earthly life. Yet they remained faithful and they endured throughout their life. You know, and, 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 and I, as I was looking at this contrast between these two groups, I was kind of thinking to myself, you know, if I get to pick which one I belong to, guess which one I'm going to pick? You know, I, I, I want the one that comes out of things with everything being victorious. But there's this other group that on our, from an earthly perspective, during their earthly life, they don't see that. But they endured. But they endured. See, one of the things I think that we learned from this is that, number one, you don't get to pick which group you belong to. You don't get to pick which group you belong to. God does. That's God's decisions, not ours. What God is looking for from all of us is, is, is a, a kind of faith that will get you through it. Not just to face it, but will, will get you through it. That you, you not only endure it, but you know whether it comes your way or not, you still endure. Now notice, notice what it says. They did not receive what was promised since God had provided something better. Something better than what? Something better than deliverance. Something better than freedom. Something better than whatever. Something better than release from bondage. God had provided something. What was that? You know what it is? It's God. God provides himself. They're, they're, you see, listen, what gave them endurance, supernatural endurance, was their eyes and their focus was not on the difficulty of the moment, the pain of the moment, the crisis that they were facing. They didn't focus on that. Their focus on, was on something better, on God himself. You see, you see, you see what, what enduring faith says is, is that what I find in God, no matter what I experience in life, God is better. Oh, I long to be, I long to be victorious. I long to be the one, you know, that's, that's leading the army that puts alien armies to flight. I love to be that guy. But whether I, I, I am successful in that battle or not, I'll face it. I'll, I'll go through it. Because the reward at the end is God himself. And that's enough. Endurance principle number one. Enduring faith believes that God himself is better than what life can give you now. And better than what death can take from you later. Enduring faith believes that God himself is better than anything that life can give you now. And it's better than anything that death can take from you later. You see, enduring faith believes that there is, a, there is a resurrection for believers and it's waiting for those who experience, you know, who, who come to Christ. And, and will we escape affliction? Absolutely. Absolutely. There is a guaranteed victory in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You see, the focus of, of an enduring faith is, is not on the blessings that come from God's hands, but on God himself. You see, these people had a death-defying passion for God himself. And nothing in life could shake that. Nothing in life could take that away. Their passion was God and God alone. Oh, I want to be delivered. Oh, I want the pain to cease. Oh, I want to get out of this crisis. But if God is with me in the crisis, that's enough. Nothing that life brings my way can touch that. And that mentality carried them through every crisis that came their way. Now let's jump into chapter 12. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Now let's stop, push pause, not literally on Facebook by the way, all right? But push pause and let's take a look at one word. Therefore. Therefore. 
You see what that word does is it connects what comes before it with what is going to follow at this point. And, and, and listen, every time you see therefore in Scripture, what, what it's trying to do is produce some kind of movement within you. Some kind of transformation, some kind of change, some kind of response. Therefore is a connecting word and it's designed to connect the teaching with the way that you live from that moment on. And, 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 and it goes all the way back to chapter 10. You see, you see, listen, you see, the, the examples that were given to us been, of all the, the, the heroes of the faith in chapter 11 are, are meant, listen to me, it's meant to stir your hearts. It's, it's meant to do something within you. It's, it's, it's meant to produce a new resolve. You know, if they endure, then I want to endure. And I really, honestly, I don't think that there's any way for me to overstate the importance of this. Because this really, listen to me, this is how the Bible produces change in people's lives. You ever wonder what causes people to change? Therefore, that's what causes people to change. You know, I've I noticed that in you know, my, my years that there are some people who never grow. There are some people who never change. They never progress in life. They just kind of get stuck in one place and they never move beyond the things that kind of hold them. And, 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 you know, and, and then there's others, they, they're kind of reading the Word of God and all of a sudden, you know, the Word of God gets a grip on them. And, and, and you know, and, and, and it, it produces a therefore. It stirs within them to such a degree that there's this resolve, that there is this determination, you know, for a new direction, a new way of living, a, a new attitude, a, way of, a, a, a new way of experiencing things that come their way in this world. You know, and, 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 and some people, they, they kind of, they read the Bible and there's never a therefore. And there's others, they, they run in, they read something and all of a sudden, they can't get away from it. And it produces something brand new in their life. Now, there's something very interesting about this verse in the way that a lot of people interpret it. And I think that a lot of times, and I've heard a lot of sermons on this, through the years and I, I think that it's preached wrongly a lot of times notice what it says it says uh, since we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses now who are they well they're the, they're the people that have come before that right they're yeah they're all the people in chapter 11 you know and and others in chapter 10 and such and 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 so, so the way that I've heard this preached is, you know, well, you've got Noah, and you've got Moses, and you've got Abraham, and you've got David, and you've got Gideon, and you've got all these in there. And it's like they're sitting in this great cloud of witnesses. They're like some grand stadium in heaven. And they're peering over the portals of heaven. And they're, you know, and they're witnessing what you're doing down on life. And they're there cheering you on, you know. And, 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 and it's, you know, listen, I, I want to tell you something. The saints in heaven are not sitting, in, uh, sitting around in heaven fixated on you, okay? The saints in heaven are fixated on the glory of Jesus. Their gaze is on the wonders of heaven. In case you haven't discovered this, you're, you're really not the center of the universe, okay? <laughs> I, I, I just mean to, be, mean to be, you know, just a little honest with you here for a second. The fact is... Some of you just, your lives are not all that interesting. You know, heaven is not, oh, look what's going on with that little guy. You know, and that's not what's happening. The most interesting thing going on in the cosmos is not what you're doing down here on planet Earth. For them, they're mesmerized with the glory of Christ. And they can't look to anything else. Now, now so when he talks about this great cloud of witnesses, he's just talking about people who have gone through all the kinds of stuff that's referred to in chapter 11. You know, the, the, the word witness is actually, in Greek, it's the word we get the word martyr from. And, and it really is a person who has died, paid the price for their faith. That's, that's a witness. You know, we, we use it in a little different way in today's English, but the word originally meant that. You know, and, 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 and they're people, they're witnesses. They felt, the, they felt the heat of the fire. They suffered through the heartaches of discouragement. They, they felt the weariness of exhaustion. They faced crises in their life. Crisis? Some grammar, gra, grammarian can, can check me out on that one. 
You know, they, they face one after another in their life, you know. And, and, and they ran their race. They faced the sword. They were thrown in the lion's den. They faced persecution and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. And, you know, they ran and they ran and they ran and they ran. And they endured. Now that leads me to endure, in, 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 um, endurance principle number two. Why did they do that? Why did they face the problems that they faced? Well, you can run with endurance when you have assurance. They had assurance and the, they had a promise. Now, some of them didn't receive the reward of that promise. Some of them did. But all of them had absolute blessed assurance that when God says something, he's going to keep his word. They faced difficulty after difficulty and they run through their crisis because they heard the Savior's voice calling to them at the finish line. You see, that's really what endurance is. It's, it's, it's not getting bowled over, overwhelmed, you know, uh, stuck in confusion. There, now, there are times that, that they, they face those kinds of moments. Everybody does. You know, they, they, they they, they, there are times in which they wept. There were times in which their heart was broken. There were times in which their mind had to be confused. You know, there were the, the times when their hearts must have, you know, kind of felt, you know, I'm too weak to deal with this. Times when they, maybe times when they even caved into sin. Times when they felt like a failure. You see, but God honors them. Because they continued to run. They didn't let anything stop them. They ran through it, one after another. Why? Because at the end, they hear the voice of the Savior calling them on. And I want to tell you that when you hear the shepherd's voice calling you from the finish line, there's nothing that's going to stop you from running. The one thing that you can't do once you hear the Savior's voice is stop. You can't quit. You know, and, and, and you see what they believed in their hearts was lived out in their life. Now notice what it also says. It says that, uh, let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Now, now wh wh that's a kind of interesting language. And, what, you know, the idea that it's picking there, pick, uh, pointing out to us, rather, is, is that, that there is a particular race that is set before you. Now, the, the, the word race, it's actually, it's a fascinating word in Greek. It's the word agona, and from it we get the word agony. It literally says they ran the agony set before them. And some of you can just sit there and you're saying, Amen, I know what that's like. You know? You know, it, it, it's a difficult struggle. It's a hard race. You know, it, it really is. It's, it's a struggle of a soul. Agonizing. Now, so when it says the race set before them, the idea there is, is that it's a predetermined race. You, you don't get to pick the race that you're going to run. God picks it for you. You know, it's not like Noah could, could, could say to the Lord, you know what, you got this long list of people there. I saw Enoch in the list. You know, Enoch, remember Enoch? He's a guy that lived like, I don't know what, 900 years, and then it says he didn't die. He was out, yeah, he was out for a walk with the Lord one day, and the Lord said, hey, you know what, we're closer to my house than yours. You want to come home with me? And, and so he just, you know, and so, and so he walked home with the Lord. So Noah sees Enoch's name on there and said, hey, you know what, I, I kind of like, his races are far more appealing than, you know, like confronting a complete world that's filled with evil and worldwide destruction because of the flood. Can I have his race? He didn't get to pick that race. God picked it for him. Enoch's race wasn't Noah, and Noah's race wasn't Enoch. Every race is personalized. It's individualized. It's predetermined. And you know why, listen, you know why Noah ran his race? Because God knew that Noah would endure it. It was Noah's race to run. You know, why Abraham? To confront the circumstances that he encountered. Why David? Why Gideon? Remember Gideon, he said, man, I'm just way too small and too weak. I can't do anything. You know, 
But the Lord picked him because he knew who Gideon would, who he really was and how he would respond to the struggles that they, that they were going to face as individuals. God picked them because they could endure in their circumstances. And, and you know what, I think that that's true about all of us. Each person is picked to endure their particular race because God knows ultimately, listen to what I'm saying to you, that you can endure. Now, you don't get to pick the circumstances that come your way, but you do get to pick how you're going to respond to the circumstances that come your way. And you see the idea is, is that they had a leg of the race. The whole human, the whole course of human history is one big long crisis after another. You know, the one big long race. And they had their leg of the race to run and you've got your leg of the race to run. And your stretch of the trail has been picked out by God himself. And he picked you to face it. Because he knows that you can endure. So now what happens, in the, in, uh, as the author of Hebrews continues, he, he, he talks about some things that uh, will give you a, a greater endurance. Now, endurance principle number three. We've got to throw off everything that hinders. So to run with endurance, we've got to remove the things that hinder. Now, when, he, when in the Bible's talking about things that are hinders, there are really two categories. There's the sin that entangles, and then there's the uh, things that hinder. There are things that kind of weigh you down, and then there are things that kind of tangle you up. Uh, now, now the, the word hinder, it, it's an, again, it's a very interesting word. In, in Greek, it means bulk. It means weight, unnecessary weight. You know, stuff that weighs you down. And, and, and you say, well, you know, that's what I'm trying to do right now. I'm trying to get rid of the bulk. You know, I'm going to Jenny Craig and Weight Watchers and, you know, and, and that's not the kind of bulk that he's talking about, even though it's still true, you know, but, 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 but that's not what's being referenced here. So, so when he's talking about things that hinder, they're not things that are necessarily moral or immoral. There are things that are morally neutral, if you will. There are a lot of things in life that can be like that. And, and, and they're not evil, but they can still keep you from enduring. There's, there's things that can choke out devotion to Christ, preoccupy your attention to such an extent, you know, that you're sidetracked from the race that he's called you to run. Um, you know, and, and, and there are a lot of things, you know, it's not, it's, there's nothing wrong with wanting to be comfortable. There's, not, there's nothing wrong with money itself, earning to make a living and earning money. There's nothing wrong with that. Hobbies, recreation, you know. You know it, there's nothing wrong with any of those things. You know, you can earn, you can own things and, and that kind of thing. But the problem comes in if it owns you. You know, if it has you in its grip and you can't do anything else, you're so focused on one thing, it becomes a hindrance in the race that God's called you to run. Sometimes you need to strip off the dead weight, the things that are bulking you down. You know, don't, don't allow things in your life that are unnecessary, things that aren't helpful, things that are negative in your life. You know, um, you know and, and, and are we going to experience, you know, different kinds of emotions from time to time? Of course. There's nothing wrong with being discouraged or being frustrated. Nothing wrong, you can't escape being angry once in a while. You know, those are common experiences to everybody. But if it begins to own you, it becomes a hindrance. You know, you, 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 can, you can experience those kinds of emotions from time to time, but you don't have to allow them to take up residency within you. You don't have to allow them to reside within you. You got to cast them off. You know, you, you, you can't run any kind of a race, a race with a bowling ball shackled to your leg. You're not going to get very far that way. You know, sometimes it's just a lousy attitude, a lack of patience. Sometimes it's constant unloving comments. Sometimes it's just an unwillingness to tether my tongue. You know, sometimes it's, you know, getting offended at the drop of a hat. You know, and, and again, there are all kinds of things that we can very easily fall into, but you don't have to allow those things to take a, a residency within you. 
They'll keep tripping you up and undermine your endurance every single time. Get rid of that stuff, that dead weight that's in your life. Um, so endurance principle number three, throw off everything that hinders. Endurance principle number four, get rid of the sin that so easily entangles. So, so now it really is kind of interesting here. Things that cling so closely, some translations put it that way. He's referring to things that so wrap you up that causes you to trip and to stumble and, and, and prevents forward movement at all. You ever seen a picture of a prisoner, a guy that's in shackles, maybe in a courtroom, and they got to walk him in and out, and you'll see that he's got chains on his legs, you know? And, and you know why? Because you're not going to be able to run with those things on your legs. Nobody's going to run a race shackled, you know, at the ankles. You know, you, you got to remove the things that entangle. Now for me, I'll tell you what, every time I read this, I, I read this, uh, this passage, I go back into my childhood and I remember a, a black and white movie that I saw as a kid. And I probably wasn't more than like eight or nine, maybe 10 years old. I saw this. I used to love watching Tarzan. You remember the, remember the black and white Tarzan movies, you know? And, and, and Johnny Weissmiller, I think was his name, and he had this really unique call. You want to hear it? I'm not going to do it. <laughs> you, you, can, yeah, you, you, you can practice that way. You know, go out in your own, your own backyard and try it. You know? and, and, so, you know, and, and, and so, you know, Tarzan, there was always this, you know, seemingly, there was always this uh, underwater scene where Tarzan was swimming across some African... Uh, 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 river and and Tarzan anytime he went he left the house he always had a knife between his teeth you know and he'd be swimming across and maybe some giant uh, hippopotamus or a crocodile or a big snake would come up you know and 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 one time I remember in particular you know there's this Tarzan swimming across I don't know who was in trouble maybe it was a boy or Jane or maybe it was cheetah I don't know who he's trying to rescue but He's off to rescue somebody, you know, and he's swimming across the river. And, and, and all of a sudden what ends up happening is, is the camera goes down to the bottom of the river and you see this giant eye. And, 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 and the foe that's coming after Tarzan this time was a giant octopus. Now, I never realized that, you know, that was a problem in African rivers, that there were giant octopuses there, but apparently pretty common in those days, you know. And so, so you see this, this, this big eye peering up from underneath the rock, and all of a sudden, here comes this tentacle. Tarzan's trying to swim across. This tentacle reaches out, and it wraps around one of his ankles, you know. And as a kid, I'm thinking, ah, that's no big deal. Tarzan can handle that, you know. Tarzan, man, a tentacle, that's nothing, the Tarzan. But then all of a sudden, here comes another tentacle, and it reaches up and it grabs him on the other ankle. And then here comes another tentacle, and here comes another, and pretty soon, Tarzan is all wrapped up in all these tentacles, and he's water and thrashing around, and the giant octopus is pulling him down, and I'm thinking to myself, oh no, this is the end of Tarzan, you know? But thank God for that knife between his teeth. Tarzan never left home without a knife between his teeth. So he takes out the knife and he begins slashing away at all the tentacles that are holding him up. You know, and all of a sudden, you know, he, 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 he's free. The, you see this big inky blot in the water, you know, and the giant octopus sinks down to its watery grave, you know. And he gets to the shore and cheetahs jumping up and down and Jane comes up and gives a big sloppy kiss and boy, boy's just so glad that his dad was able to rid his favorite watering hole from giant octopuses, which is a pretty good thing for a dad to do. You know, and, and, and Tarzan is a hero and he avoids and gets out of all the things that are entangling him and pulling him down. Sin is just like that. It starts out small, one tentacle at a time. Just a little drink, just a little puff, just a little look, you know, and, and, and pretty soon out comes another tentacle. You know, just, it, it's just a little gossip, it's just a little lie. It's just a little arrangement of the truth. It's just, a, you know, and, 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 and one tentacle after another, and pretty soon 
We're so entangled, we can't imagine how we're going to get out of it. So the writer of Hebrews says, don't allow that to happen. Remove any entanglements that keep you from running with endurance the race that God has set before you. One translation puts it this way, we should remove from our lives anything that would get in the way and the sin that so easily holds us back. You won't run this race well until you deal with these issues. There will be a constant hindrance in your life that will prevent you from finishing what God wants you to do. You know, some of you have been running this race and you're trying to run this race and you just keep getting tripped up. And because you keep getting tripped up, you keep on getting more and more tired. And, 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 and God, through the Spirit, has been saying to you, you know, you've got to deal with this unwillingness to, to cut these things out of your life. You need to do exactly what Tarzan did. Cut it out. The unwillingness to be aggressive and confront the sinful attitudes and the behaviors of your life is going to keep you from enduring. You don't toy with the tentacle that's wrapped around your throat. You cut it off. I mean, imagine going into your home today. You're trying to get in your house and right at your doorway there's a vine that gets right there and you just keep tripping over it and keep tripping. What are you going to do? You got to get rid of it. You got to cut it out. Couple more. Endurance principle number five. To run with endurance, you have to fix your eyes on Jesus. Fix, uh, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter of faith, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now, here, he says, if you really want endurance, you've got to be very, very, very careful about what you're fixated on. He says, if you, really want, if you really want endurance, it's good to have a picture of what the saints have done in the past. But they're dead and gone. They set a good example. He said, but you really want to run with endurance, how about changing your gaze? Instead of looking at the past, look forward to Jesus. Fix your gaze on Christ himself. The one who made the world. The one who upholds the world by the uh, word of his power. The one who is sovereign over everything for all eternity. The immutable, unchanging, glorious, sovereign, majestic, righteous, holy, gracious, merciful one. The one who rules all things and always accomplishes his will. The one who is never frustrated. He always does what he desires. The one whose power is never thwarted. The ever-present one. You know, he's always supporting, he's always sustaining, he's always upholding, he's always supplying, he's always strengthening, he's always sufficient. The one who was the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And you see what he's saying is, is that it was Christ himself who gave all those previous Old Testament saints the endurance that they needed in their race. And I guarantee you, listen to me, he will give you the endurance that you need as you're running your race. Fix your eyes upon him. You come to a point in your life, you think you can't continue. You think that it's too, bi too bad and too, too painful, too, too frustrating, too uncertain, too scary. You think you can't endure. Look to Christ. And Christ will produce in you a supernatural ability to endure. How could he not? How could he not empower you to endure? Notice how he's described. It says that he is the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith. King James says he is the author and the finisher of our faith. In other words, he is the first and the last. He is the alpha and the omega. He is the beginning and he is the end. And everything that is in between. You know, and, and by the way, let me say to you that he knows what you're going through. I mean, in, when Jesus talks to us, it's not like he's talking from a position where he did not understand what it was like to endure. Probably better than any person, that anybody that has ever lived on the earth, Christ understood the concept of endurance. He had his race to run too, don't forget. 
You know, he, 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 you remember, remember in the garden, the struggle that he had with endurance. Father, if it is possible, take this cup from me. But then he said, but not my will, but yours. And he's sweating, he's agonizing over the, the, the torture and the, and the persecution and the humility and, and this, more than anything, the separation from God the Father. And, and, and Lord, if it's possible, take this cup from me. I don't know, from a human, that's, that's Jesus speaking out of the incarnation. Jesus speaking, being fully man. Lord, if it's possible, take this from me. He agonized. He had a hard race. Don't think that Jesus doesn't understand that some races are hard. Don't think that Jesus doesn't understand that the difficulty that's run, that, 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 that's involved in facing difficult circumstances. Now, every minister, every evangelical minister at least, would say over and over and over, fix your eyes on Jesus. Have you ever heard of an evangelical minister that didn't say that? You know, I mean, every minister, every faithful minister is constantly going, look, you got a problem? Fix your eyes on Jesus. That's the solution. You know? And so I, I don't know how many times I've said it in my, in, in, in my uh, ministry. Tens of thousands, minimum. Tens and tens of thousands. Why? Because Jesus will sustain you. That's why. Jesus will be there for you when everything else isn't. You know, you, you, you know it, it's all good, you know. It, it's good, isn't it good, you know, to have maybe somebody that you love say nice things to you, and, and, and that's good, right? And, and, and it's helpful. It, 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 it's, it's great when, you know, you have friends that, you know, say something that's encouraging to you, and it kind of pumps you up and gives you a, a little bit of encouragement. It, it's really cool when you get a card in the mail. Somebody says, you know what, I was just thinking of you, and, and just wanted to tell you, you know, that, I'm, that I love you and just wanted to give you a word. And that's really cool. I remember a time in my life, man, I got a card, just literally a card from a friend of mine. And he just wrote, you know, he said, just want to let you know that I'm thinking of you. And I'll tell you that at that particular moment when I looked into that card and I read that message, it was more important to me than breathing my next breath. You know, that word of encouragement. But I want to say to you at the same time that as, as, as wonderful as all those things are, when Jesus speaks a word to you, when, when the Savior speaks a word of encouragement or empower to you, you can have a completely empty tank. And when you hear the voice of Jesus speak, you're ready to take the world on and start running the race again. Last one. Endurance principle number six, remember the reward. For who, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Now, now, now I'll be honest, you know, when you look at that verse, there's nothing that's normal about seeing the word joy and the word cross in the same sentence. That's odd. I don't think there's any human being that would say that. You're going to find joy and a cross. You know, there, there's nothing joyful about a cross. I mean, you think that your crisis, your race has been difficult? You think that, you know, you, you, you keep on saying to yourself, I don't know how to go on, I don't know if I can go on, and, you know, and, and it's just so hard, you know? You know, and... and, and you take a look at the, the, the examples that were given to us in chapter 11, people sawn in two and people flogged and people hiding in dens, you know, and their bodies offered to the man all day, you know, they had it tough. But I want to tell you that Jesus had it tougher. Anybody here have to endure a cross? We're going to, next week as we continue on this passage, you know, it's going to say, look, in your struggle against sin, you have not resisted to the point of shedding your blood. You know, we, we talk about a cross, and we, most of the times we're talking about it as a metaphor. It wasn't a metaphor for Jesus. It was real, and it was rugged, and it was beyond description. It was lethal, and it was deadly. And yet it did not keep him from, it did not dissuade him from going to running his race. He had an endurance even when he was on the cross. 
And where did that endurance come from? Notice what it says. For the joy that was set before him. Now, now, now let me tell you what, what that's saying to you here today. It's saying you can endure any race with a fixed concentration on the finish line. You can endure any race if you keep your goal focused on the finish line. Jesus knew the cross. He struggled with anxiety in his flesh because of the cross. And yet Jesus had this unique ability to look beyond what the cross was bringing to him. On the other side, there was perfect communion once again with God the Father and God the Spirit. And, and, and that joy in that communion together, it just, you know what, all right, so yeah, that, he, he's, got, he's got horrible, undescribable, unspeakable suffering that he's going to go through. And yet for that joy, he looks at the finish line. And he says, this will not stop me. And it was more than a communion even with God the Father and God the Spirit. It was communion with you. The joy in the union of a child of God being united with the creator of the universe. And he said, that reward compels me. Not to stop, but to move on. We live in a world today where instant gratification is what our culture sells every single day of our life. I want to tell you that if you're focused on instant gratification, you cannot endure. Let me tell you something. The race is not about the race. The race is about the finish line. Ask anybody that runs. We've got a problem with our internet. Ask anybody that runs why they run. Every single person that runs, runs with one particular vision in their mind. There's nothing we can do about it. Yeah, if it's not connected, it's not connected. It said it's trying to connect, but it is what it is. Every single guy that runs, every woman that runs a marathon, you know, they gotta, they got to push through the pain. they got to push through the, 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 you know, the difficulties. You know, they got to push through the discomfort that comes their way. But every single person, while they're preparing for that race, they got one point in their mind, one vision that's focused in their mind. And you know what it is? They keep replaying over and over and over in their mind, that moment, that one moment, that, that second when they finally get across the finish line. Olympic athletes will, will train for years and years and years just envisioning that moment when they get across that finish line. That's what they run for. You know, and, 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 and so Jesus, he, he looked at the finish line and he says, I got to run. There's a reward at the end of it. There's a reward at the end of it for you too. Listen, there are three different kinds of motivation that, that make people kind of, mo there's an internal motivation. Internal motivation are our goals and our ambitions which we feel on the inside. There's external motivation. That's pressures that people put on us. You know, you do this or you're going to get fired. That's external motivation. But I want to tell you the one that's most powerful and that's eternal motivation. Eternal motivation is, 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 is the reward that awaits us for all eternity. And I want to tell you something, if you really want to endure, that's where you've got to keep your focus. You know, there, there are times where you're going through life that the things that have motivated you in the past will kind of lose their appeal to you. You know, there, there's going to come moments in your life where earning the next paycheck just isn't going to cut it. There's going to come moments in your life where, you know, uh, having the fancy car or the big house or, you know, uh, the, the next work opportunity, all the kinds of stuff that we normally kind of strive for. There will come a moment in each of your lives in which those things will lose their sparkle. They will not draw you forward. You're just going to, you know, I don't care about that stuff anymore. You need a motivation that will last. A motivation that will give you endurance. 
And the only one that I know of is eternal motivation. Look at what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 2.9. Uh, I think I... There we go. There we go. 1 Corinthians 2.9 No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love Him. You can endure anything. Fix your eyes on Jesus and fix your gaze on the finish line. How do you respond to a problem you thought was going to be a sprint but then turns into a marathon? More than anything, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Remember that old hymn? Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim. In the light of his glory and grace. Let's all stand and sing that again. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of His glory and grace. Father, we come to You. Father, with a heart, a spirit that longs to endure, Bless your children, empower, sustain, and enable each person, Lord God, Father, to run their race well. Father, there's some that are discouraged and some, their tank has been on empty. Some that are uncertain and some that are fearful. Some that are anxious. Lord God, we need a strategy that's going to take us into the future. We need to learn how to endure. So bless each one, I pray. Supernaturally put your hand on the shoulder of those who are needy this moment. Whisper in their ears, we all need to hear the voice of the shepherd. Lord God, encouraging and empowering and sustaining. Let there be real transformation, real change. Real strength, real forward thinking. Lord God, that each one of us would, want, would run our particular race well. Not in the eyes of the world, but in your eyes. We praise you, we love you, and we thank you for the time of your word. May it be effective in our lives and thereby bring glory to you. In Jesus' name.